I'm going to talk about the large numbers hypothesis, yes. often abbreviated to LNH. Uh, it's an idea which enjoyed popularity at certain times, but it's um, largely ignored in modern physics. Um, I don't know that they have an explanation for it, or they want to say it was interesting, but um, a couple of very famous physicists, um, Dirac, who had a Nobel Prize in physics and worked out how to do a lot of stuff that hadn't been worked out before, and Eddington, who was um, also a shark cookie, um, and he was responsible for uh, one of the first people to recognize the significance of what Einstein did with general relativity. And uh, he worked out, look, there's these tests we can do, you know, we can look at light as it comes past the sun during an eclipse. We can see stars that are, that are near in the line of the sun and we can see the bending of the light. And that relativity predicts that would be twice as much as it would under Newtonian physics. So it's a test to see whether that's real, and when they did the test, it was satisfied. It was some difficulty doing it, because this was all happening around the time of the First World War, so there's a lot of interruptions to these things. Yeah. Einstein was German, and um, <coughs> Eddington, was Eddington was a Quaker in, in England, yeah. uh, and they did have communications with each other. And I think it was in the Second World War that those communications... Um, yeah, well, he, as a Quaker, both. he didn't want to fight in the war, right? Yeah. And so, and then he can communicate with the Germans. So this creates suspicion. Um, but um, they both appreciated the fineness of each other's minds and, and their communications. So anyway, Dirac and Eddington both liked this large numbers hypothesis. I better tell you what it is. What it is that they liked. Yes. <clears throat> there were th there were three numbers that they derived from different considerations of the universe which was beginning, the, the size of the observable universe was beginning to be worked out and what it was composed of. Uh, and uh, these three numbers um, looked like they had something to do with each other, but it wasn't obvious how. Uh, the first number is the, the relative strength of the electromagnetic force of the charge force between, say, a proton and electron in a hydrogen atom, the force that required to keep that, that in orbit, keep that attracted at that point, compared to a gravitational force between the same things. Now we can't measure the gravitational force between a proton and electron, but we know their masses, so we can calculate what it would be, but it's infinitesimally small. In fact, the charge force is 10 to the power of 40 times stronger than the, uh, than the um, gravitational force between them. 10 to the 40. 10 to the 40. So that's the first occurrence. Uh, when I say 10 to the 40, around about 10 to the 40. Yep. Um, there'll be some digits on the front of that, decimal places. Uh, that, but um, that's a, it's a huge number. And um, we, it's, gravity on this basis is an incredibly weak force. Now, you'd, if you tell that to a guy that just fell off a 10 story building, uh, he's not going to agree with you for very long while he's getting squished. But it, it seems to us a very strong force. But the um, the charge force is vastly stronger. It's just that most of the time we're dealing with things that like that, that are neutral. Um, we are effectively neutral. We can pick up a few extra electrons or get rid of a few, but most of the time we're neutral. So you stick a big charge thing next to us, it doesn't do anything to us. No. Um, in lightning strikes and stuff, we can see a, bit of, a little bit of that energy where for a moment something was a bit out of kilter and whoosh, it decided to do it right. Yeah. Uh, so that's the first occurrence of 10 to the 40. Yes. There's another occurrence of 10 to the 40, which they did in terms, they called it the age of the universe and the time for light to travel across a subatomic particle. I'm going to say that's a, a, better, uh, a better way of doing that because the age of the universe, if it did have, does have such a thing, is changing with time. And I don't think that this number necessarily is changing with time. So uh, it, it, I'm going to express it a different way. I'm going to say the size of the observable universe compared to the size of a subatomic particle. And that ratio is also about 10 to the 40. Now, um, if you believe in the Big Bang, the size of the universe would be changing anyway, so that ratio might be changing if the size of the particle wasn't changing, but uh, I'm going to suggest that maybe that's not changing at all, mm -hmm. that it's 10 to the 40, uh, or it's not necessarily changing. Yes. The third thing that they came up with, which was um, seemed to be related to this, and then the large numbers hypothesis, is that in the observable universe, the distance that we can see out to, um, which is about 14 billion light years, it's actually not a strictly a point because um, it's you conceivably could see the odd thing beyond that, but um, it's a fading out that happens around there. That 
in that sphere, there, the number of subatomic particles is about 10 to the power of 80. Um, 10 to the power of 80. Yeah, a lot of particles in the universe, in the observable universe. Yeah. So uh, we've got these three numbers. Two of them look like they're about the same as each other, and the other one looks like it's about the square of them. Hmm. Um, it's not necessarily expected to be exactly the same or exactly the square. There may, quite often we get things, we get a formula like pi r squared. Um, so something might be squared, but there might be a pi on it. Uh, so we're not talking exactly enough to say there whether there's a pi on it or not, or there might be a four-thirds pi or some other thing, some other ratio, some other small constant that goes on it. Yeah. But near enough, we've got two things similar and another one that's about the square. Understood. Yeah. So now the question is, um, Eddington put forward a lot of ideas to try and um, explain this. Some of his ideas were interesting and good. Sometimes people thought he bordered on getting a bit flaky with it, you know, he was trying too hard. Um, he did do other things. There's the, this other number, the fine structure constant, which is 1 over 137. And he tried to explain how the 137 came about. That's where it got a bit funny. But the other funny thing is that 2 to the power of 137 is around about 10 to the 40. So there's something else going on there. Um, there are some hints that, that that may be a meaningful connection. Interesting. Yeah, so let's take um, the view that I've put forward based on harmonics theory, but also based on the wave structure of matter. The understanding that um, all atomic particles are actually a wave structure with a spherical wave coming into a point, passing through that point and coming out again, and the inwards and the outwards wave interacting to make a standing wave in space. So, so we see a particle as that. We're not going to talk about what the limit is there for a moment. We're just going to see that this extends over this overextended region. As we go further out, the waves from all the different particles are all crisscrossing each other and interacting, but they're passing through each other. Apart from very near each other, um, which is uh, where, where the matter is very concentrated, at that stage we will get refractions and other things happening. But once we get far away, uh, those waves will be travelling without interacting with each other very much. Uh, so um, we can see this from our everyday experience. Um, when we look at our hand, we can't see the inside. No. Right? So uh, this is the light we're talking about, but the, wa the other waves will be doing something similar. There will be a lot of refraction happening there, which makes it opaque. Um, except some materials like glass we can see through. I don't know why that is, um, but yeah. it's interesting, isn't it? Yes. But, uh, but even so, the light speed inside glass is different to what it is uh, in a vacuum or an air. Um, it gets refracted, so uh, we know that there's stuff going on. Yes. So, what happens to these waves as they go further out? Yeah. Well, at the, if we talk about the um, radius of the particle, <coughs> we can get that several ways. One of them is uh, that um, when protons and neutrons are banged against each other, they act as if they've got some size because they either go past each other or they don't, or the interference effects, where they tend to bounce a little bit in that, they can pick a size which is about the effective size of it, and the answer they get is similar to what we get with the other method. The other method is, uh, in many cases, the particles act as if they're waves. Uh, the wavelength they have is called, uh, or the frequency they have is called the Compton frequency. And the, the wavelength Compton frequency. Compton, yeah. yeah. So Compton was a famous physicist, mm -hmm. worked out a lot of stuff to do with these waves of yes. matter. And uh, the, the Compton uh, wavelength would be the, the effective size of the particle there. Yeah. Uh, in both cases, what we get from protons and neutrons is about 1.3 femtometers. Uh, femto is a tiny fraction of a meter, 10 to the minus 30, 10 to the minus. 12? Oh, look that up. 13 minus 10 centimetres, something, 10 to minus 15. That's got a lot of decimals before the, we get to the thing. Yes. Um, so those are the um, the effective size of that innermost part of the, pro the proton or neutron, the first wavelength. Yes. And um, it, if you're going to think of it as a little hard particle, you think of it as that size, but it's not really. It's it's more dense at the middle and it's getting less dense as you go out. So it's cl it's cloudy, misty. Yeah, because it's a wave. It's a wave, yeah. Now, when we go out a, a large distance, um, some number of times that wavelength, that, that wave has been spread over a sphere as it's going out and as it's coming in. And that sphere has a size that is 
um, the surface area of it is the square of the distance. Right? Um, okay. Um, the, the surface area square is um, is four pi r squared. Um, so when you go from one wavelength to say a million, the surface area becomes a million million, right? Times as big as it was yeah. originally. Yeah. And the energy is spread over that much. If you were to go out a distance that was 10 to the 40th times the size of that particle, yeah. the surface area would be spread over an area that's 10 to the 80th times as big, 10 yes. to the 40th squared. Yes. This is starting to sound like some of the stuff we talked about. It sounds a little familiar. Yeah. So uh, if we consider an area which we call, why is it this value we don't know, but if we consider this 10 to the 40th size, which is the observable universe, yeah. then the surface area of that is 10 to the 80th times the surface area of the individual particle. Uh, so what that suggests is that the wave can't go further than that because by that point, more or less every part of it has hit the surface of another proton or neutron. Yeah. It's not that there's a shell of them there, but scattered throughout there, bits of it we're hitting some little bits were getting refracted and other things as well but more or less we can say that the outgoing wave of a proton and neutron became the incoming wave of protons and neutrons um, by that distance effectively more or less all the energies become the incoming waves of those and so that connects the 10 to the 40 of the si size of the universe compared to a particle with the number of particles in the observable universe it should be the square of that when we understand the, the, the wave nature Yes. Um, now, we want to connect it to the gravity as well, uh, yes. the gravity versus electromagnetic force. Yeah. Um, that this has an aspect of 10 to the 40. Yeah. In the harmonics theory, mm -hmm. every wave develops harmonics, which are fractions of its original wavelength. So if we start with this whole universe vibrating, we may have a single wave across it, but it's because of the way it's going, it's generating harmonics, and it will make waves that are two, three, four, five times original frequency. And these continue to the same. We'll talk about that separately in the harmonic theory talks. Yes. Uh, but it's sufficient to say that over vast periods of time, it develops waves which have this um, distance between the modes that corresponds to um, galaxies. A very strong wave occurs at galaxies. There are other waves that occur that explain um, galactic superclusters and so on, galaxies, um, larger and smaller galaxies, there's different peaks. The, as we go on, we'll come to waves that are, that are very strong peak in the waves that explain stars, um, and another one that explain planets and moons and so on down until we get to cells and subatomic particles to atoms and subatomic particles, and eventually they would explain that, that they would make a prediction about the scale at which quarks. So we're starting quarks. out with very long waves, yeah. and we look at the harmonics, which are divisions of it. It's kind of yeah. musical. Uh, the wavelength and distance uh, had, creates the likelihood for where galaxies will appear. Yeah. The harmonics go down again, and we have where stars will appear, yeah. and we can keep on going with that harmonically until we get to sub subatomic. Sub 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 now, um, it's not that there are any just discrete levels. These are the points at which is the biggest peak in the energy. Yeah. Uh, there are other stuff in between. It, it, every, it's, a v it's a very rich structure of um, stuff going on at all scales. But s some are more observable than others because they rise to a big peak where they, they show up. When we get to the uh, protons and neutrons, the, 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 the nuclear particles, the process isn't finished. It's still going on. Energy is still going to harmonics. Very gradually, stuff is being built within these particles, uh, which we may recognize as the beginnings of quarks uh, that are going. Do you say quark or quark? Well, I say quark. And, uh, quark, was that? that was, yeah. Quark, yeah. Quark. Okay. If I say quark, people know what I mean. The, uh, it may be that in our part of the universe, they, the waves there are forming but they can't yet exist independently um, of the proton and neutron um, because they're just a little part of it. Uh, whereas protons and neutrons can exist independently um, of being in atoms. They can come loose and go flying across. Mm. Uh, so 
uh, it may be that in a vast amount of time in the future, and I'm not talking about billions of years, I'm talking about a lot more noughts than that, that they would have been fully developed in this part of the universe. It may be that right now, uh, in places like the um, cores of galaxies, uh, or, or where there's black holes, that the energy densities there are sufficient that this nonlinear process has taken the harmonics further and that those things can exist there. And this will explain why there can be much more energetic events there than standard physics says because you're actually going another, another level deeper in the structure. When you're dealing with atoms, you have uh, energies that are not very great uh, when they interact with each other, chemical reactions. Now some chemical reactions, like dynamite and stuff, um, they are big energy. Yes. But they're nothing compared with nuclear reactions, right? Nuclear yeah. reactions have vastly more energy. Each time you go down another level, it's roughly 30,000 times more energetic. When cells interact with each other, it's a very delicate thing. The cellular thing itself that I say is a wave there, and there is an, and I say there is an atom wave, um, which we recognize from such things as the, the um, bond lengths in, um, in molecules yes. or in crystals. Um, and then there's then the nuclear force is very strong between protons and neutrons. The same thing would happen at a deeper level again uh, with quarks, but either as a result of vast passage of time or in places where the energy is much more concentrated. Bigger power comes from smaller vibrations. Yeah, smaller and smaller vibrations, more power. That's Planck's law. Um, and so where were we going with this? We had these protons and the neutrons harmonics of the waves and the and energy is falling at smaller scales that process is very very slow the non-linearity is not so great that it happens very fast the speed at which it's happening uh, has to be sufficient to explain the red shift apparent red shift with distance which in another talk we said is actually a blue shift with time because of this retaining of uh, energy by the process of the protons and neutrons forming um, uh, harmonics. Um, but You've helped explain a lot of the relationships in large number hypothesis. Yeah, but we haven't quite finished that one because we've got the gravity there. Yeah. Uh, if we're going to explain gravity, mm -hmm. it, sorry, it wasn't gravity, I was doing the red shift. If we're going to explain the red shift, the rate at which the energy have to be absorbed must mean that for each oscillation of the particle it would be absorbing one part in 10 to the 40th of the energy passing through it. That would, that would then lead to the red shift relationship that we see uh, with distance. Yes, faraway galaxies. It would also mean if it's absorbing one part in 10 to the 40th of the energy that's passing through the center, it would also mean that gravity is actually a sucking force that absorbs one part in 10 to the 40th of that rate, that energy going through there, and that gravity is 10 to the 40th smaller, weaker, than the charge force. So the same value, that 10 to the 40th, mm -hmm. will explain the fact that uh, there is a strict relationship between uh, gravity, gravitational relationship, and the redshift relationship. The same answer works for both. Uh, so that brings the third 10 to the 40th in. Yeah. Why the number is 10 to the 40th and not some other number, um, it's, not, it's not obvious. Um, there are some hints on that, but I'll leave that aside from this discussion because it's not... Uh, um, what I'm saying there, I think, is all fairly definite stuff. Uh, not all, some of it's standard physics, some of it's not. Some of it follows from standard physics, but people haven't realised it does.